Hey y'all, this is episode 286 and today I'm answering all your questions. I wish I could tell you what we're chatting about, but I legit have no idea because I copy and pasted all of these questions into a document and I was like, I need to record right now. Otherwise, the show is not going to go live on Sunday, December 13th, more like January sometime. (laughs) So if you have questions about today's content or you want to submit a question to me and you're like, wait, how did people get their questions on the show? You can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me if you're like helpful pursuit, helpful what is pursuit? easiest thing to do is just go to the show notes today and click on the little link that says contact me. If you're not sure where the show notes are on your app or whatever podcast app you're using, the best way to do this is to just click around on your app until you find them. Or if they are hidden as some apps do, just go to the Google machine and type in the app you're using. So for example, podcast app or casts app, and then write show notes and it'll show you on Google how to access the show notes of the show. Now, this isn't just for my podcast. This is for like all podcasts. So understanding where the show notes are is really, really helpful. A lot of hosts will include extra links and support and details and freebies and everything in those show notes. So it's helpful to check them out for every episode. If you're enjoying the Keto Diet Podcast, you can catch up on previous episodes by going to ketodietpodcast.com. Also, that will have the links and show notes in there if you get totally lost. Okay, let's do this thing. Hey, I'm Leanne Vogel. You're listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. I've created a free guide with tips on how to start keto and maintain your fat-fueled life. Grab it at healthfulpursuit.com slash free as a little thank you for listening to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me today. If you're new around these parts, my name is Leanne Vogel. I'm a holistic nutritionist and the best-selling author of The Keto Diet, The Keto Diet Cookbook, and Keto for Women. I can't even believe I've been at this for 13 years. It blows my mind. I'm so, and so, so appreciative that you're here today um, learning some things about your body. So without further ado, let's just get into these questions. So, Our first question is from Shauna. Good morning. I just watched the video about trouble digesting fat. I do often feel nauseous when I eat my keto meals, though I do have a gallbladder. I love beets, but there's one of those foods that I gave up when I went keto because they are on the high carb list. I'm on week four of classic keto. Now Shauna's referring to the plan in my paperback book, The Keto Diet. Could I add in beets? Uh, Would they be a carb up? that I could only have once a week? What's the serving size? Thank you for your time and consideration, Shauna. Well, Shauna, thanks so much for submitting your question and being so kind and wonderful. Oh, so great. Okay, so a couple of thoughts here. When you first start the ketogenic diet, generally speaking, it's going to be a lot of fat. And I found especially lately, like I'm six years into my ketogenic protocol and where I could handle a lot of fat before, I just, I can't go over 140 grams a day. There's just no way. It just makes me feel so, ugh, I just don't like it. So um, if that's you and you're just having a hard time digesting these fats, there are a couple of things that won't uh, or are not considered a carb up. And we'll get into what a carb up is in a second, but I really want to break this down. So a couple of ways to help your body digest fats. First is a supplement called ox bile. I will include a link in the show notes for that. And secondly, there is a product called uh, Gut Shot. I will include a link in the show notes for that. Uh, It's basically sauerkraut juice. And you can even get like Bubby's sauerkraut. You want like the good fermented sauerkraut, not the alcohol or rather vinegar. (laughs) May as well be alcohol, really. That stuff is disgusting. Um, Vinegar-based sauerkraut, like you want the fermented sauerkraut. So eat all the Bubby's kraut and then drink the sauerkraut juice. This can help stimulate bile production. And so your liver is the prime, well, is the organ that creates bile. And then from there, the bile is then transported over to your gallbladder. So this is the concern that a lot of people have when they don't have a gallbladder. They're like, well, can I digest fats? Yes, you can. You just can't store the bile. So it's really important to constantly be creating bile because you're going to need it to shoot the bile out and digest the food. So 
because you already have a gallbladder, Shauna, we just need to make sure that your liver is supported, that it's creating the bile and that your gallbladder is holding it and then releasing it. So the ox bile can help with this. The gut shot can help with this. Drinking sauerkraut juice can help with this. Having um, water kefir can help with this. Beet kvass can help with this. Now, these are all low carb options. Then when you're doing a carb up, so this is where you are starting to introduce variants to your ketogenic diet, where you're starting to add carbohydrates, timed carbohydrates into your ketogenic diet to support your gut, to support your hormones, to support your mental well-being, so that you can have, I don't know, chocolate cake on your birthday and those sorts of things. Um, so the foods that can help create bile when you are doing a carb up are beets. So you can definitely, you know, steam some beets and add some salt on there and a little bit of olive oil and maybe some oranges and maybe some dill and maybe some, what's that other thing I put in there? I think, oh, walnuts. Yeah, that's a good, good snack. But you don't need to go that hardcore. I just um, shared some foods with you that are totally keto or rather uh, assist with the metabolic process of keto. Um, so that's a really good place to start. But if you're like, I don't know, foods, it's all crazy. What do I do? Ox bile is a great thing. Also, a digestive enzyme with ox bile is just as well. And I think I'm going to include one of those in the show notes because it's good to kind of have a one-two punch when it comes to your digestion, not only with the ox bile, but also with the digestive enzymes. Okay, next question is from Katie. Hey, so I'm currently about two weeks into my second go around with keto. Woohoo! First round about a year ago helped me lose 20 pounds of baby weight. Awesome. And I had all the other benefits that you talk about. I fell off the wagon last fall and in March this year developed really loose stools, no cramping or pain. I just couldn't seem to fix it. So now I'm two weeks into my second round with keto thinking and hoping it might help any suggestions or tips. Thanks for your time. Your books are super helpful, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Okay. So here's the thing. All of us think that the ketogenic diet is the diet that we need to follow 100% all the time or we're just not doing it. We may as well not do it. And so I really, really, really want to delve deep into here with a couple of words of encouragement that if you are experiencing something like disaster pants situation, loose stools, and you think that maybe it's because you're eating a lot of fat, to go with Shauna's question, maybe it's a chance to help your microbiome and help even going deeper than your gallbladder, you know, getting into more prebiotic foods, probiotic foods, and really helping your gut. Another one, like we were talking with Shauna, is your gallbladder. Another piece is rotating your carbohydrates, rotating your foods, and going a couple of days having things like sweet potatoes, medjool dates, uh, oranges, white potatoes, like keeping it primarily paleo. You can play around with quinoa if you want, maybe, I don't know. Um, I'm always pretty like anti-grain over here, but you can kind of feel for it. And then just get back on keto and see how that helped. And if you, in those times, are focusing on foods that are going to be helpful to your gut. Now, I'm not saying go to the cupcake store and eat a dozen cupcakes. I'm saying there are foods that are quote unquote, not on the ketogenic diet that are still really helpful, like uh, oranges. <laughs> Citrus is really, really healthy, not only for progesterone creation, but also for vitamin C. And so if you're having a really rich, uh, more vegetarian based meal, that's really high in iron. If you're not having vitamin C with that iron, you're not going to absorb a lot of it. So why not put an orange on there and help your iron? And yes, it does have carbohydrates, but you're helping. So do you see what I mean? We don't have to do this balls to the wall, absolute keto or nothing at all situation. It's really just about rotating things and benefiting your metabolism overall. So I actually have a really good example of this. I'm kind of going on a tangent, but hey, it's my show, so I can. <laughs> we went out with friends last night, or rather yesterday afternoon, really it turned into a whole night thing, which was so lovely. And we went out and we were at the restaurant and I chose beautifully keto, wonderful food. So the first one, uh, my appetizer was tuna sashimi and I got all the stuff taken away from it. And I just wanted the sashimi and some ginger. And so I had that. It was delicious. And then for my main meal, I did a burger wrapped in lettuce and a side salad. And everyone else was like having all the carbs and everything, but I didn't feel too bad about it. And then our friend said that she wanted dessert. And I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds great. So we went to a dessert place and I had dessert. And so 
you know, I could have made a big deal about it and said, well, if we're going for dessert, I may as well have fries and I may as well do this and that and the other thing. But no, I had a little bit of gelato and a little macaron and it was delicious and I didn't feel 100% great after, you know, I was kind of sugar high and feel a little bit off today, but so much better than if I had gone in there being like, I'm going to let myself have whatever I want and I'm going to have this, that and the other thing and just do it. Not because I really want it, but because it's like available to me and I think that really comes with the diet mentality piece. And this took me years and years and years to master. And even that, I don't have it down all of the time. But I knew, you know, going out, we're probably going to have dessert. And so I can make a great choice that feels really good in my body. And if I decide after that that I'm still hungry and I want dessert, then I can have a little bit. And, you know, coming at it from that angle, I didn't even finish the gelato. Like it was very, very sweet and I didn't 100% enjoy it. But I still had some and I enjoyed the company with friends. So do you know what I'm saying? It's not an all or nothing thing. And so I hope, Katie, that that was helpful, just that rotation and a couple more examples. And I wish you luck on your second go round of things. Let's chat animal protein for a sec. So most places don't care about the treatment of the animal, the taste of the meat, the impact on the environment or the health of their customers because they're not involved in that segment of the industry. But at Bel Campo, they do things differently with purpose. They care about all of it and see that everything is interconnected and hopes to create an experience and product better in every way for people and for our planet. Bel Campo's farming practices are climate positive and certified humane, and the products are rich in omega-3s with significantly less omega-6s, higher in linoleic acid, vitamin C, B, E, richer in minerals, and deliciously healthful fats. I'm obsessed with Bel Campo. It's next level farming with meat you can trust start to finish delivered right to your door. You can get 20% off with the code KDP on your first purchase, excluding sale items valid until the end of December when you go to bellcampo.com slash KDP. They have a nice selection of special cuts for the holidays, including turkeys for pre-order. And if you're looking for something more for every day, they have ready to eat keto meatballs and carnitas, something for any meat eater to love. Again, that's bellcampo.com slash KDP. Use the coupon code KDP at checkout for 20% off. Okay, next question is from Heather. What is your experience with keto for somebody with elevated cholesterol? I have elevated cholesterol and was told to lose weight and work out more. So I am finally in a better pattern for working out and have struggled with food, crazy cravings and binge eating. I started eating keto because my hubby was ter- had terrible migraines and after research found that keto helps. I recently added dairy-free keto to the mix and feel much better. Woohoo! but still worry about cholesterol going up as keto is not an anti-cholesterol diet. Okay, Heather, this is great. Yeah, I too have uh, elevated total cholesterol, but my triglycerides and HDL and LDL are all fine. So it's really important to understand what the numbers mean and how to interpret them. If you've been told by your doctor that you have high LDL, it's important to ask them what LDL size it is. And if they're like, it doesn't matter, then my recommendation would be to find another doctor that, you know, references up to date science. And so understanding the LDL profile is really, really important. There's a profile test that you can run called the NMR profile. And so if you uh, run that, you're going to know what your LDL size is. And there are various different particles, but the two main ones are LDL pattern A and LDL pattern B. Now, if the pattern B is high, then yeah, it's a problem. If the pattern A is high, it's not really a problem. And so it's really important to understand that cholesterol isn't really influenced by diet. No matter what you have or how you adjust things, your body If it's a genetic issue, now this is a big one. If it's a genetic issue, it will not be adjusted no matter how hard you try. Like it just, your body will just create more or really is not influenced by how much cholesterol you do or do not have. Having said that, however, there are women that go on the ketogenic diet And because of the APOE gene, I think it's A-P-O-E, I'm pretty sure, you may react to fat poorly. And so in that case, your ketogenic diet is going to have to be lower in saturated fat than somebody like me who thrives on saturated fat and does far, far better. 
And so how do you know if you have this gene? Well, the best way to know is to test with like a 23andMe genetic test so you can pull that and see. Now, <laughs> this, this is where it gets kind of complicated, but not really. When you get your results back from the 23andMe test, it's not going to actually tell you these things because it's in the raw data. So you have to pull the raw data and upload it to something like uh, Found My Fitness. Um, she has uh, an amazing uh, little website. You can just go to Google and type in Found My Fitness uh, DNA or genetic table and it will pull it up and you just upload your raw data and it tells you way, way more information than those other websites do. So that will help to tell you whether or not you are sensitive to saturated fats or not. And then from there you can structure your ketogenic diet. Now, I don't really recommend this for everybody. Chances are you're going to be fine on saturated fat, but if you are on the ketogenic diet and your cholesterol is increasing and you're concerned because your LDL is increasing, you're like, what's going on? You could be one of those people. However, now kind of backing up a step, what you eat does affect your cholesterol and that your triglycerides, HDL and LDL can shift. And so ideally what we want to see on the ketogenic diet is that your triglycerides lower Sometimes they increase, like depending on what you're eating before, your LDL is going to lower and your HDL is going to increase. And you're like, why? That makes no sense. All we're doing is eating animal protein. So your triglycerides are directly related to how many carbohydrates you eat and how sensitive you are to carbohydrates. So your carbohydrate tolerance, which we're going to be chatting about in episode 291 in January, it's a really good episode. Hold tight. It's fantastic. Really, really tells you uh, how many carbohydrates you can handle. So I've worked with people where their triglycerides are nice and perfect and beautiful and all they eat is carbohydrates. And so that tells me that they have a far higher carbohydrate tolerance than those that even don't eat that many carbohydrates, but their triglycerides are still pretty high, they're going to have to work pretty hard at keeping their carbohydrates pretty low in order to have their triglycerides at that perfect number. Now with HDL, that's going to increase with saturated fat content. Now, if you're one of those people with that APOE gene, then it's going to look a little bit different for you. But I would say overall, Heather, the most important piece is if a doctor is telling you that you have elevated cholesterol to really understand what that means and really, really, really understand whether or not that's your LDL uh, particle B. If it's the LDL particle B, it's a totally different story than if it's, you know, triglycerides being low or HDL being low or, or total cholesterol being high. All of those things are what I've seen to be really helpful um, and aligned with the ketogenic diet. Okay aligned with the ketogenic diet. There's also a book called The Cholesterol Myth, I want to say. Um, look in the show notes. I'll make sure that I get the book right in the show notes. I'll just make a little note in there as the cholesterol book that I recommend. I've read a couple and this one was really good, but I can't remember the title. Too many books, so little time. So I hope that that was helpful. Okay, next question is from Alyssa. Hello, I restarted keto five weeks ago and not seeing any results this time around. I'm in my 30s and I work night shift. Two years ago, I lost 20 pounds. I gained a lot of that back and took a long break from keto last year. I was doing yoga at the time, but due to online schooling with my kids, COVID, and working nights, I haven't been able to work out like I used to. I walk our dog on days off and I try to stay within my limits. Just curious what I could be doing wrong this time around. Thank you. Okay, Alyssa, a couple of things here that just uh, showed out to me. First is night shift. And so it's harder on the body. It's harder on the adrenals. Uh, your circadian rhythm is going to be off. So it's super, super important that I know this is almost impossible. And every time I see this, people roll their eyes. I was one of these people too that worked night shift. I think it was 11 to 7 or 11 to 10. I can't even remember. 11 to 9. 11 p.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, for four days a week. And then on my days off, I would just go back to regular people timing. And oh man, did that screw me up. So the best advice I have for you is even on on your days off, try to keep with your schedule to get that pattern going. This is probably the best for your hormones, the best for your body. And it might be pretty challenging because you did mention kids and working nights and things. So probably on your days off, you're running around during the days. But if you can try to keep somewhat of a similar schedule, 
even if that's, you know, on your days where you're working, you're, you're waking up earlier so that you can go to bed earlier and just kind of shift things around to get it as close as possible. That really helps to make sure that your quality of sleep is good and that that pattern is consistent day in and day out. If it's up or down a couple of hours, it's not a big deal, but especially with night shift, like shifting when your day is and your night is, oh, your adrenals have no idea what time it is. Your circadian rhythm is off and that can throw off everything. It might be really important to you also um, because when you're under stress and you feel like you haven't slept, your glucose could actually be higher. I'm curious to see whether or not if you were to even pinprick at random times during the day, perhaps even fasted, that your fasting glucose could even be higher. And I have a feeling that's likely due to stress. And so like the year 2020 has not been kind to a lot of us and there's a lot of stress and a lot of our bodies have changed because of it. I think ultimately having a goal of moving your body in whatever capacity is usually best, but generally speaking, weight loss happens with the foods that we're eating. And it could be, Alyssa, that you know, you did keto, you lost 20 pounds. That was two years ago. A lot can happen in two years as it relates to your hormone balance. Um, so I would say focus on the foods you are eating. Now, if you need guidance with that, I have a bunch of paperback books and programs on my website. I think specifically for you, if you want to move forward with something and, and have help would be my six week keto weight loss program. There's currently a wait list. It's starting again in January. So that could be something you could look at. I'll include a link in the show notes if you want to move forward with that. Otherwise, really focusing on your food and your sleep and hydration and maybe just checking your glucose once in a while to see. I mean, ideally having a continuous glucose monitor so you could really see what's going on and how your sleep is affecting your glucose. The reason I recommend this is because when insulin is out partying in the body, doing what it's needed to do, (laughs) you're not losing weight. And so if you are constantly having elevated glucose, elevated insulin, perhaps even a little bit of insulin resistance, then it's going to be more challenging to lose weight. And just with night shift and shifting things around and the stress, that could very much be the thing. So we chat about this a lot in the six week program of adding variation, really focusing on healing to understand what's going on inside the body, specifically with hormones. So I hope that was helpful, Alyssa. You know what I love more than anything in the entire world is helping people. And when I meet a complete stranger and they're telling me about symptoms that they're having or symptoms that their dog is having or their loved one, oftentimes the first thing that comes into my head is you should try CBD oil. And I'm in fact sitting in my car right now. I just drove an hour and a half to a friend's place to drop off a bottle of Eaton Hemp CBD oil. Their dog's having a really difficult time with an inflammatory condition. Nobody knows what it is. And I just thought again, you need to try CBD oil. Now CBD oil has massively reduced my symptoms of anxiety, but CBD oil does so much more including inflammation reduction, improving digestive function, improving sleep quality, reduces acne. But here's what you have to know before you grab a random bottle and start supplementing. Research, research, research your options thoroughly. Look for a CBD oil that uses hemp seed oil as the carrier oil. Now the hemp seed oil means that the plant has been kept in its purest whole plant form, allowing for the terpenes and cannabinoids to work together in unison in your body to give you the powerful entourage effect that everyone is always raving about when it comes to CBD. Among high-quality CBD options, Eaton Hemp's unfiltered, full-spectrum CBD oil is an all-organic choice. Again, all-organic choice. They are one of the first unfiltered CBD products to be USDA-certified organic. This guarantees what you see is what you get. No toxins, no pesticides, no label trickery. Eaton Hemp uses hemp seed oil as a carrier for CBD, giving you the full entourage effect, maximum absorption, potency, effectiveness, terpenes, cannabis, aka results, which is all good things. If you're like supplementing, how do I even do this? Now, I personally 
only take a dropper full a day with my dogs up until both our dogs passed away. Lexi was supplementing with 15 milligrams. She's a 60 pound dog. And Pebbles, who is a 10 pound dog, did a dropper to a day. Now with our dog Coconut, who's developed a little bit of inflammation, I've started giving her 10 milligrams a day and she's an 80 pound dog. I personally couldn't even imagine my life without CBD. It extended Lexi's life by three years, giving us so much more time to spend together when vets said it wasn't even possible. I cannot tell you how powerful a supplement this has been for me and my family. Now, I chatted with my friends over at Eaton Hemp and they put together a sweet deal for you. If you go to eatonhempcbd.com slash keto diet, again, that's Eaton, E-A-T-O-N, hemp cbd.com slash keto diet and use a coupon code keto diet you're going to get 20 percent off all eaten hemp cbd products that includes the salves and all the crazy things you can get into when it comes to cbd that's 20 percent off with the code keto diet at eaten hemp cbd.com slash keto diet Next question. Vanessa, I have a question about MCT oil. I've been using both the liquid and then I went to Perfect Keto brand powder. Both ways bother my stomach. I've been using MCT for a couple of years and finally gave up as it makes my stomach upset. Is there anything that can be substituted as another option? Any help would be appreciated. Thank you, Vanessa. Oh, Vanessa, I'm so sorry to hear that it hasn't been helpful for you. That, That really sucks. Now, It could be the MCT oil. It could also be the acacia fiber that's mixed up with the MCT oil powder. It's very rare that people react to this, but if it's the same stomach upset, yeah, it's probably the MCT. And that's just because it's a processed oil. Um, Now that doesn't make it a bad oil, but for some people, they just can't handle it. So depending on how you use MCT oil, generally speaking, people add it to things like smoothies and coffee. So when it comes to smoothies, I do a liquid coconut oil that can be helpful as can almond oil or hazelnut oil. Or if you want to go with like a flaxseed oil, that can be helpful to add to your smoothies and like colder items. And then for heated items, like if you like adding that stuff to your coffee, uh, ghee, if you can handle dairy, butter, if you can handle dairy or cacao butter, which is the fat from chocolate is also helpful as a replacement. So I hope that gives you some ideas. I think specifically for traveling, if you just need a fat to travel with, because the MCT oil powder is so easy, going with a coconut milk powder will make your coffee creamy like the MCT oil powder did. And you can carry a couple of cacao wafers in your bag or purse or whatever. And it takes a lot to have them melt. I'll include the wafers in my in the show notes today. And hopefully that would be helpful for you so that you don't have any more digestive disa- disaster pants feelings because that sucks. Okay, next question is from Haley. Hi, Leanne. I've been so, 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 so helped by your books. Woohoo! Your podcast, awesome, and your website. I praise God for your calling to care for women specifically in this way. Thanks, Haley. I'm writing because of your story with disordered eating. I need help, and I would love your recommendations on what resources to pursue. I've had seasons of victory, but recently not, and I'm scared and ashamed. Keto has helped me come to a place of food freedom, and I'm back into obsessive calorie counting. Hormones out of whack, crazy town, help. Oh, Haley, I feel that so incredibly deeply, and I actually met a friend recently um, who is wonderful with all of this and such a beautiful topic. I'm actually having him on the show episode 294 on Sunday, January 31st. So if you just want to mark off your calendar for that, um, we're going to be talking all about how keto can help eating disorders and really how to balance the whole calorie thing. It can be really, really, really challenging to get out of the obsessive calorie counting situation, or even if you're not calorie counting, you're still doing it in your head and your sleep. And I still find even to this day, sometimes when I'm falling asleep, even though I've been in recovery for three and actively trying to heal myself of an eating disorder for the last 11 years or so, I count my calories before bed. I'm like breakfast, 400, lunch, 800. I'm like, what am I doing? Ah, So it takes time. Really, 
a big thing for me when I was working on recovery was to any time that I noticed I was doing something, I would like yell it out for anyone to listen, specifically my husband. I'd be like, calorie counting. And he'd like come to me and be like, hey, like, let's stay busy. Let's go outside. Let's do something just to like have that um, support system. That was really, really helpful for me. If you have somebody in your life, even that you can just text like random words to like, bah, this is happening. And for you, especially, I would say no fasting. I feel like fasting can be very much like a binge purge cycle, even though it's not binging and purging as we know it, but it's very much the similar of like, oh, I ate too much. Now I'm just going to force myself not to eat for hours and hours and hours. And it'll like erase what I did before. So when it comes to fasting, I would avoid that. Also be very, very careful with the information that you allow in your life, you know, like podcasts, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, whatever you're using to get information, even if it's to just live your life. What are you soaking up? What magazines are you reading? Uh, what books are you reading? What audiobooks are you listening to? Where, where is the input? And when you start to look at all the different inputs and the messages that you're getting, I think a lot of it contributes to the feeling of being scared and ashamed. There's, there's nothing to be ashamed of by struggling with a disordered eating relationship situation. And I think, you know, I had an experience years and years ago where I went on a retreat and these women were so wonderful and amazing that after a week I told everyone I had an eating disorder and then nobody talked to me again. And it sucked and it's a mental health issue. And, you know, there are so many other things that people could say, you know, this, that, and the other thing when it comes to eating disorders, there's a stigma and I'm sure there are with other mental health issues, but that was definitely my experience when I had an eating disorder was I would say something and then people wouldn't know what to say and they'd get awkward and they'd get awkward with me around food. I mean, it still happens. People that know my past are like, yeah, but what did you eat today? And I'm like, none of your business. I don't know. Isn't that weird? And so it's really important that one, you speak your truth and you share with whom you feel comfortable with of like, hey, I need your help and I need assistance. I need a buddy or that buddy is a friend or your partner or I mean, even my dogs, (laughs) Uh, Lexi always knew when I was feeling weird and I'd go to her and talk to her and pet her and we would go for walks and it was just really helpful to just get out of the house and get out of the funk and create that gap. That's really what what it was about for me. Now, personally, I went to, I don't know, thousands upon thousands of dollars of therapy. And for me personally, it only made it worse. And so I don't recommend not reaching out to people and therapists and working with them. Uh, That wasn't my experience. I went through all of that through group therapy and it didn't help. Um, So for me, it was always creating the gap. So when I felt an urge coming on or I felt something happening, I would literally get out of that situation. Like if it was, excuse me, I just, I forgot my phone in my car. I'll be right back. Or, oh, I need to run to take this phone call. Or, oh my gosh, my dog is barking. I'll be right back. Or just like getting out of a situation like, bah, like just exit and then just process, process, give yourself a moment, moment and come back to it. That's always been really helpful. I mean, I even did that last night. You know, we were talking about the dinner. Uh, the appetizer came and I was getting a little bit apprehensive. So I was like, excuse me, I just have to go to the bathroom to wash my hands. I'll be right back. You guys start. And I just went to the bathroom, you know, like took out my Invisalign, looked in the mirror, like gave myself a pep talk. And that was totally fine. And just to like recenter myself. So because you submitted this question and you read my books and all the things, and also you said, praise God for your calling lean on him, you know, get into prayer, get into silence and, and just be with your father. And so that can be really helpful too, of just, um, bridging that gap and, and asking for help. Okay. Next question. Laura is saying, what is the optimal blood sugar range for weight gain during keto low carb? I feel good around three. Now this is the metric measurement, but when I'm around 4.5 or more, I feel dizzy and I'm not sure why. So I'm going to convert these numbers for people that are not using the metric system and are on the standard system. So three is equal to 54 and 4.4 to 4.7 around there is like 80 to 85. So this is strange to me feeling dizzy around 80, 85 plus. 
I would guess that if you're feeling like, I don't, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this question. I think sometimes it's really challenging, um, to answer when I don't have more information. I would say that when it comes to blood sugar range, anything below 50, so that's 2.8, even anything below 54, which is 3.0, um, in metric, now this is assuming blood pricking. Okay. So like finger pricking, blood monitoring. If you're using the CGM, the levels are going to be about 10 points higher in the standard measurement. And so it's really important that you understand that also because 10 points is going to be about 0.5. So if you are reading on your CGM 4.0 in metric or 72 in standard, then that's really, if you were to pinprick, you're probably going to be around 3.5 or 65. Okay. So 3.5 in metric or 65 in standard. I know this is a lot of numbers. Try to follow me. So it's about 0.5 off in metric and 10 off in standard. So you kind of want to be above that 3.0 mark for metric and 54 above for standard. Now, I personally sit around 50 to 55, 60. Now that's like 2.83, 3.3. That's kind of where I feel best to be on keto. Like I'm in a ketogenic state. I'm burning fat. I'm feeling good. If I go below that, I start to feel woozy, almost like drained of all blood. That's like the only feeling I just feel drained of all energy. Now, if I go above that, you know, this morning, um, I had a bunch of food and, you know, I had that ice cream. So I woke up pretty hungry. Anytime I do sugar, I wake up hungry. I did bone broth and tried to like level things off. I was sitting at around 70 this morning. So that's 3.9. And I felt off only because of the food that I'd eaten, uh, eaten rather the day before. And so it's really important that you understand also like your glucose, while it is a good indication of what's happening right now, what's happening right now is based on what you did previously. And it, nothing happens in a vacuum, especially as it relates to your body. So it's really, really important to understand like when you are around 4.5 or higher, you feel dizzy and you're not sure why, um, what are you eating that brings you to that 4.5? Now, 4.5 is not a bad number. 4.5 in metric works out to be about like 83 in standard, which is pretty common. You know, when I'm eating a, even a ketogenic meal, if there are any plants in there, like I'm going to go up to 80s and that's completely fine and you shouldn't feel dizzy. So I don't know the old correlation isn't causation thing might stay here. I don't know if the 4.5 is what's making you dizzy or the food that you're eating that got you to that state. So I hope that that was helpful. If you want to learn more about um, glucose monitoring and all these things, episode 279, um, we chatted about mastering the metabolism with continuous glucose monitoring. That's a big one to just understand glucose and the role and all the things that are happening. And then episode 292, it's going to release January 20th. We're going to be talking a bunch about glucose on there as well. Just so you can continue to learn, Laura, and I hope that my answer was helpful. I really hope you're enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. You can snap a pic and tag me at Leanne Vogel or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. Okay, next question, Alia. Okay, uh, hi, Leanne. Firstly, love you. Been following you for about three years and you're awesome. Thanks, friend. Uh, my question is, I've been off keto for a while and I think it's time to return, but my concern is I'm in my mid-30s and looking to start a family, so I'm worried about how being back on keto while trying to conceive will affect my hormones and ovulation and fertility window. Any insights here? I recognize all bodies are different and there's no one-size-fits-all answer. Anything you can share and thoughts on would be helpful. Elia, I have so many thoughts. How much time do you have? <laughs> I'll try to keep it simple. Okay, so you have your follicular phase, that's before ovulation, and then your luteal phase, that's after ovulation. So if you set a goal from days one to 14 that you eat keto, 
Okay, so you do keto and about on day 13, 14, like right before ovulation, you have more carbohydrates. So you focus on more progesterone building foods. And so you would start to just incorporate those, like have a base of keto. So maybe there are days like day 17, 20, 22, 24, whatever, just choose days. I don't care where you're still eating keto, but then other days where you're eating keto, but you're like adding on carbs. So when I say adding on carbs, you are then taking away fats. Okay. You bring the carbs in, you take the fats out. It should really be a song. I should work on this, but (laughs) so you want to bring in the carbs, take out the fats. So you're on a ketogenic, very paleo ish eating style, but you're adding in those carbs following your ovulation. So starting at around day 13, 14 or so. Now this depends on how long your cycle is. I find for me, it starts around day 13, 14 and I ovulate actually on day 18. So it takes like a little bit of time. So I start adding a bit more carbohydrates in. There are some days where I'm doing keto. There are other days where I'm not. And as I get close to my period, I am not fasting. Okay, when I say not fasting, it's that I'm not doing anything more than 18 hours. I repeat, (laughs) the closer you get to your period, you do not fast more than 18 hours. (laughs) This is a big one because women struggle because we look at this ketogenic diet. We're like, yeah, yeah, I can do all the things. I can do all the things that all the men do. And then we do it and then it screws up our bodies and we're losing our hair and we're losing our cycle and we don't want that. So by having this rotational plan of, your follicular phase, then ovulation, luteal phase, and you kind of separate your diet that way, you're going to find actually like days one to 10, especially fasting, keto, high protein, you're just going to want it. Whereas as you get closer to a cycle, you're like, where are the carbs at? Can we just like, can I just have a sweet potato for dinner? And just allowing yourself to flow with that. That's probably the best fertility plan. If you want to go even deeper, just as I mentioned before, In Alyssa's question, the six-week program is all geared toward hormones. Now, this is specifically weight loss, so you don't need to follow any of the weight loss stuff, Um, but it's all about hormones and eating right for your cycle so that you can support your hormones on a ketogenic diet. So again, I will include that link in the show notes if you want to go deeper, but what I just shared is a great first template to get you started. And congratulations, making a family. I'm really excited for you. Okay, next question. Christine, hi, Leanne. I have your keto book and I read it and I'm unsure which plan best suits me. I'm a triathlete and strength train three times per week. I need to lose 10 pounds and I haven't tried keto but want energy for my workouts. Can you advise which plan would be best for my workouts? I do one hour of endurance five times a week. Okay, so this is a unique situation, Christine, where you're doing both aerobic and anaerobic exercise. And so with aerobic, you can go strict keto, more like a classic keto outline, but with your strength training, more um, glucose required activities, you can't really go that route. And so for you, it's probably going to be a pretty adapted rotational plan that you're going to want to do. And you're probably going to have to set it up yourself. You can definitely use the recipes um, in the keto diet, in the keto diet cookbook. Either one of those are really great. Um, You're going to need to add carbs likely before you strength train or after. So on days where you're just doing aerobic activities, do the classic keto route. Just eat keto, uh, low carbohydrates, high fat, the whole bit. Then you can test out having your carbohydrates the night before your strength training and see if that fulfills you. If that doesn't work, about an hour before your strength train, if that doesn't work, uh, following your training or both. So what I normally find is if it's a really heavy lift, at least once a week, you're probably doing a heavier lift than the others. That's usually the time that you want to load up the carbs after just to help satiate the muscles and get them really plumpy, big, awesome. So um, you can kind of play around with that. But the classic keto, kind of look at it, at it as your home base where you're doing most of your triathlete training. And then you can bring in spot carbohydrates here and there. So this gets into more, oh, a bunch of stuff that we don't have time or space to kind of experiment with together, unfortunately, but you could look into dextrose. Now, yes, I just said dextrose on a ketogenic diet. What, Leanne, what the heck? 
It's actually really helpful because it's a pure glucose. There's no fructose. And if you want to completely bypass uh, the liver, which fructose is involved with this, if you do have a fructose, like if you eat a banana before a workout, your liver is going to be involved in that and it can mess up your workouts and all the things. So it depends. You said you're a triathlete. So like, I'm assuming that you're pretty hardcore. So if you're doing your strength trains and you find like you are having a hard time staying in ketosis, you just need the fuel to get through your workout and still have energy. Dextrose before the workout is helpful. And you can play around with different mixtures and things like that. Um, I used to do just pure dextrose um, with a tiny bit of fat before the workout. And that worked really well for me. And I have some clients who do the same thing. Also on your days where you don't need to be like totally on fire, you just need like a little bit of energy a mixture of 10 grams of protein with like a tablespoon, like a teaspoon or tablespoon of MCT oil and caffeine and um, can be pretty helpful before your workouts because the caffeine with the fat and the protein just give you enough to do your lifts. Um, So you may be able to get away with more ketogenic lifts than anything, but really when it comes to triathlete pieces where you're doing more endurance It's all keto all the time, but it's for those heavy lifts where if you're bonking, like you're just totally hitting the wall, you need to start adding carbohydrates time. So I would do the classic keto plan and just, you know, have that your home base and then add in carbohydrates as you need to help strength train. And this is really going to be a personal thing. I'm going to take some tweaking, as I said, like the night before, the, the hour before or following and following usually. I hope that was helpful and not too confusing. Okay. Last question is from Katrin. I love your podcast. Listen to it from Denmark. So cool. And that's where you live. I started on keto seven months ago. I feel much better and have more energy. I recently went into a functional doctor's office and had lab tests to see if I am missing any supplements. The first test showed that my DAO was very low. So I should stay away from foods containing histamines. Oh no. What do I do with my favorite avocado, chocolate, broth, kimchi, and so on? Any advice to the combination of keto and histamine? Could keto foods have caused low DAO? Okay. So a histamine intolerance, which is an imbalance of accumulated histamine and the body's capacity to uh, degrade the compound, Um, can cause symptoms like dizziness, accelerated heart rate, anxiety, nausea, difficulty uh, regulating body temperature. And unfortunately, like mainstream medicine doesn't really talk about this much. So it's really, really cool that you found a doctor that's like totally open to it. So I'm just going to go through um, some histamine things. First off is you're going to have to remove the histamine foods that you like. And um, I'll go through. Why don't I just do that now? Okay, so high histamine foods include um, seafood, processed, cured, smoked, and fermented meats, such as lunch meat, bacon, sausage, salami, pepperoni, leftover meats, fermented foods, vinegar foods containing vinegar, such as pickles, relish, ketchup, prepared mustard, citrus fruits, tomatoes, chocolate, and cow cacao or cocoa, uh, yogurt, kefir, eggs, spinach, most berries and dried fruit, artificial food coloring and preservatives, spices like cinnamon, chili pepper, cloves, anise, nutmeg, curry powder, cayenne, beverages such as tea um, and alcohol, even the teas that are herbal or regular will cause an issue. So let's first understand uh, what histamine intolerance is. So It's a condition that a lot of people struggle with. I've gone in and out of it too. It's gut related. Um, Histamine is extremely important. It's an extremely important compound in the body. It acts as a neurotransmitter and regulates the production of stomach acid, blood vessel permeability, contraction of skeletal muscle. Like it's pretty important stuff. It's also a major component of the immune system and the immune response and is therefore a key mediator in allergic reactions. So while we need a certain amount of histamine for proper physiological function, some people really have um, a histamine intolerance where they produce excess histamine and or have a deficiency in diamine oxidase. And this is the enzyme that breaks down the histamine. Okay, so how does this relate to the gut? Because I said this is gut related. Well, microbes that reside in the gut are capable of producing histamine. Okay, so they generate an enzyme called histidine decarboxylase decarboxylase 
Try saying that like, uh, who makes up these words? Come on, <laughs> which converts the histidine uh, present in various proteins into histamine. So the more of these microbes that you have, the more histidine you consume and the higher the amounts of histamine produced in your gut and the histamine can then be absorbed by epithelial cells and sent to various sites of the body, exacerbating your allergic symptoms. Not great stuff. So some have actually speculated that people with SIBO may actually have an overgrowth of histamine producing bacteria. So I don't know if you've been tested for SIBO also, but they can kind of go two in one. This is going to be the histamine producing bacteria such as lactobacilli, um, specifically in their small intestine in the case of SIBO. Although lactobacilli are an important type of beneficial bacteria in the gut, they're also major producers of histamine and could cause problems with, um, or rather when overrepresented in the small intestines. We don't want that. So histamine intolerance is really unlike other food allergies or sensitivities in that the response is more cumulative and not immediate. So if I eat all the things and slowly but surely I start to experience a histamine reaction, I'm like, yeah, this has been building up for a couple of weeks. So an overgrowth of certain types of bacteria that can make histamine from undigested food uh, led to a buildup of histamine in the gut. And that's usually what we see. Now, if these high levels, rather if these foods get to high levels and then the histamine gets to high levels, the body can't keep up with the histamine and a reaction ensues. So you may um, have a reaction like itching, especially of the skin, eyes, ears, nose, hives, tissue swelling, reduced blood pressure, increased heart rate, chest pain, symptoms of uh, resembling a panic attack. These are all common um, with like a histamine buildup and a reaction. Where I get my histamine response is like on my butt and like above my butt, like right on my love handle sort of area. And that's where it shows up. So that's how I know. So doctors may associate this reaction to an allergic reaction. And but when they do like the standard skin prick test, it leads nowhere. And so this is really, really frustrating. And if you've dealt with these symptoms for a while, it's really tough. So you need to remove the foods. I'm sorry. You may also want to consider supplementing with quercetin. This is a natural antihistamine and uh, it can help with the enzyme responsible for breaking down the histamine. You can also try antihistamine herbs like thyme, holy basil is great to just add in your cooking all the time. So I know that that's like a really lengthy to-do list, <laughs> but yeah, you need to remove those foods. And it's not to say that you will always have to remove these foods. I know that I can handle now some of these foods and some of them I can't. Some of them I just have a little bit. So the, the key is to just remove as much as you can and then assess in a couple of months. So Katrin, I hope that was helpful and it wasn't too, too much. That's it though for all the questions today on the podcast. Next episode, um, I can't even believe it, Sunday, December 20th. I'm having Amy Berger and Dr. Eric Westman to talk to us about ending carb confusion. These simplify the ketogenic diet, and it's quite great if you are new and just want something super simple and to the point, really good. So watch for that or listen for that. Um, I guess you can watch it on YouTube. It's definitely a video. So if you don't follow me on YouTube already, just go to YouTube, type in Leanne Vogel, and you'll find me and uh, all the podcasts are recorded with our guests. And so you can see the videos and see us interacting. It's a shorter episode because there aren't as many ads and all the things. So definitely check that out. Um, but the episodes just with me are just audio because like friend, I pause when I'm recording this episode, I pause like a million times to like go to the bathroom. Then my dog is barking. It's like this whole thing. I'm like wearing my pajamas. My hair's a mess. Um, we're not going to record the video of that. Um, and then episode 288, uh, Sunday, December 27th, right after Christmas, uh, Samantha Marve is coming on the show to chat with us about how to stick with keto for the long haul. It's good. I really like Sam. She's super fun. So I'm excited to share this one with you. Thank you so much for hanging out with me on the Keto Diet Podcast. If you like what you heard today, it'd be great if you left a review. Just go on your app and give me a five-star rating. I'll take four. I'll take three. I'll even take a two or one-star rating. Just tell me what you think. I work really hard on this show, so it's nice to get some feedback. And to also make sure that the people that are listening actually, you know, like what I'm doing. <laughs> or if you have suggestions or anything, you know where to reach me. So have a great rest of your day and I will see you next week for another episode. <laughs> Bye.
Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor should it be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.